Hello beloved, today is Tuesday in the third week of March and our liturgical readings come from Daniel chapter 3 and Matthew chapter 18 from verse 21 to verse 35. Let us begin our reflection in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I read a story of one Roy Bockhart who had the task of finding work for ex-convicts in New York. And Roy tells of one business owner who never failed to find some job for an ex-convict. After many years, this employer asked Roy if he had never wondered why he worked so hard to find jobs for rehabilitated criminals. Then he told Roy his own life story. It seems he was a young man working for a company in Columbus, Ohio, delivering goods and collecting money. Over time, he stole several dollars from the company. One day, his boss suddenly told him, go home, I'll take your route today. But bring your wife and come to my house this evening. He waited all day with his wife. He waited all day with his wife asking why he wasn't at work. And of those hours that he was at home, he later said, don't tell me there isn't a hell because I lived it through, I lived it, I lived through it that day. In the evening, the young couple went to the boss's house and was greeted warmly by the boss and his wife. After they had visited in a friendly way, the older man turned to the younger one and simply asked him to tell his wife why he had not worked that day. It was an ordeal, but the young man began unloading the grim facts of what he had done. His poor wife broke down and wept profusely. Then the boss spoke again, stressing how morally wrong the young man's conduct had been, saying, I could put you in prison, but I'm going to give you another chance. He instructed the young man to report for work as usual the next day. And he said to him, we'll not let you handle money yet, but you will have an opportunity to redeem yourself. So he went back to work. And 11 years later, he became the president of that same company. As he related this story, his eyes filled up with tears. That was the reason why he kept giving others a second chance. My dear friends, today's gospel text from Matthew chapter 18 clearly teaches the principle of mutual forgiveness. Jesus told the story of a king who had a slave who owed him 10,000 talents. This was an enormous sum of money. Biblical scholars have calculated this to be something in the range of hundreds of millions of dollars. The king who owned the slave had every right to punish him, sell him off together with his family and together with all that he had to pay the debt. But this slave fell at his master's feet and pleaded for mercy and forgiveness. And our text says in verse 27 of Matthew chapter 18, moved with compassion, the master of that servant let him go and forgive him the loan. Now, it does not take much of imagination to figure out what Jesus is saying in, the, in this text. God is the king and we are that particular slave. And we have failed miserably to be the kind of people that God wants us to be. We have sinned and erred. We have fallen short of his mark. We are in bondage to sin and we cannot free ourselves. 
But for Jesus' sake and because of his death on the cross, God forgives us all of our sins. Because of Jesus' blood, we are reckoned as righteous, no longer guilty. As Paul will write in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, he says, There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because the law of the Spirit has set us free. And so by the power of his blood, we have been accepted by God. So, so far, so good. God loves us. God accepts us. He forgives us. But the parable doesn't end there. The parable goes on, and now the story becomes quite uncomfortable. We are called to forgive others as we have been forgiven. Because this same slave who was forgiven his immense debt confronts another slave who owes him a hundred denarii, what amounts to just about a few thousand dollars. This slave too pleads with his fellow slave for pity, for compassion, and for mercy. But the slave kept insisting, pay back what you owe. Pay back what you owe. But he was the one who couldn't pay back what he owed and he was forgiven. But now he's insisting with his fellow slave, pay back what you owe. This slave did not receive mercy. Instead, he ends up being thrown into prison. It is no wonder that the king summoned this slave and pronounced him wicked. And verse 34 states, Then in anger, his master handed him over to the torturers until he should pay back the whole debt. Beloved, along with the good news of the gospel to sinners comes also the harsh news that we are to respond to God's forgiveness by forgiving others. As we forgive others, we too are forgiven. As we refuse to forgive others, Jesus says God will do the same to us also. Jesus taught his disciples and teaches us to pray for forgiveness as we have been forgiven. When he said, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. How many times do we forgive our brother or our sister? 70 times? Or the alternative reading that says 70 times 7? Obviously, that goes against our human reasoning. We may be willing to forgive once or twice, but not over and over again. And even forgiving once may seem beyond some persons. Most of us would rather get even or nurse our grudge and grievances instead of taking steps towards forgiveness and reconciliation. In life, you know, in life, you don't have to teach someone to keep a grudge. Nobody teaches children how to keep a grudge. They just learn it. It comes to them natural. But you have to teach someone how to forgive. Real forgiveness goes beyond just words. We all need that second chance. We all need sometimes even a third or fourth or fifth or seventh chance. When Abraham Lincoln was questioned once about uh, giving an appointment to someone that was uh, obviously uh, an enemy of his, he said that the best way to get rid of your enemy was to make your enemy your friend. You see, dear friends, Jesus challenges us to forgive from the heart. It is only as we come to understand how gracious 
God is to forgive our sins, that we can also forgive our brother or our sister. We can come to understand the punishment for wrongdoing. We can come to understand that the punishment for wrongdoing is best left to God. His word says, vengeance is mine. Revenge. Let, let's leave that to God. We have God's promise to us that he would take care of the judgment. That we don't need to judge the brother or the sister. We can hand over to him. We can, can, we can lay on his, at his doorstep all of our grievances, our resentments, and our hurts. Even the ones that we consider legitimate. Those terrible wrongs that we have suffered. We can give them all to the Lord and ask him for the power to come into our hearts and minds and transform us. I remember years ago, I had a friend who was uh, in the seminary. Uh, and when he graduated from the seminary, he was not ordained. Instead, he was sent for probation for one year. He returned after the one year. He was sent for another year of probation. At the end of the second year of probation, he was told that he wasn't going to be ordained. And they sent him away. He was so heartbroken. You see, but through a friend of his, he was able to uh, get uh, associated with uh, a religious group outside of the country. And they sent him an invitation letter to come join them. He took that letter with all the documents they sent to him to the embassy. He was denied his visa application. Not once, but twice. We wept over that. But one day as I was praying, the Lord said to me, he needs to forgive all those who hurt him. And when I said to him, this was what the Lord was saying to me, he looked me in the eye and he said, you must be crazy. And he walked out on me. But I said to him, you may not believe me, but why don't you go before the Blessed Sacrament and present it to the Lord? Days later, he came to me with his eyes bloodshot red, an indication that he had been crying profusely. And he said to me, I did it. What did he do? He said, I went before the Blessed Sacrament and I said to the Lord, you know, I feel these people have ruined my life. I cannot forgive them. But if you want me to forgive them, then give me a bit of your heart to be able to forgive them. And as he knelt there crying before the Lord, he was able to utter to the Lord, I forgive them. He made a third application for visa. And this time he got it. He traveled out of the country and joined with that congregation and got ordained as a priest. My dear brothers and sisters, after all said and done, the gospel text is not about how often we should forgive or how much we should forgive because it's not about the math, it's about the mercy. During this season of Lent, is there someone that you need to forgive? Are you disobeying God's command to forgive? If so, probably you need to dwell on the sufferings of Christ for you on the cross and how much God has forgiven you of your own sins and rebellion against him. And pray and ask God for grace, for a piece of his heart to be able to forgive. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Forgive us our trespasses, Lord, as we forgive those who trespass against us. On our own, we find it so difficult, so hard to forgive sometimes. We need a piece of the sacred heart of Jesus, your Son. Give us, Lord, the elements of his sacred heart that we might be able to forgive as much as you have forgiven us. And today, we make bold a decision to forgive so that we too 
may continue to enjoy divine forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.